Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to today's webinar. So today I'm going to talk to Don. Don is um, obviously the milk quality specialist with Chagas based in Clannacilty. And Don is going to talk to us about what we can do in the, in the milking parlour basically or with uh, freshly calved cows in order to try and stay ahead of cell count before it becomes a problem. So in general what you're looking at in, in the um, early lactation phase is that most cows, assuming that the dry cow therapy has gone well for you, where you've used it, or where if you've been using Selective, you've had a positive experience in that sense as well. Cows should calve down clean in terms of cell count. Uh, and then it's just trying to manage the, the cell count, I suppose, from there on to get to the first recording in particular, I suppose. And then just the early lactation management is important in terms of how your cell count will profile will be for the entire year. So Dan is just going to give you a few tips. Again, we'll be short and brief uh, today. So I'll hand over to Dan and uh, encourage you to pop in your questions there as we go along, because I'm sure you'll have plenty, because Dan is never without questions anytime we do anything together. So um, fire him in through the Q&A there, and I'll put them to him as we go along. So thanks, Dan. No problem, Stuart. So look, I suppose we're at the stage of the, the calving season now where the fun really starts. The numbers are building up. Weather is against us. And the challenge from... Um, an infection point of view is really starting to hit. I suppose really what you've got to look at from the point of view of where you're at is I, a couple of things that I'd be looking at is how many discharges retained after birth are you having? How many cases of clinical uh, milk fever, clinical ma milk fever? Because if you do, if you are having, you're having a significant amount of subclinical milk fever as well. And these are all having significant impacts on the incidence of this strep type mastitis that's coming out. The weather conditions with the... The fact that the demand is or the challenge is so high inside in the housing. An immune system is the most compromised in a cow just after calving. You talk to your vets, they'll say this, and as well as that, the calving boxes. We have a build up of infection. Any that have cleaned them out now after a bit, you will get the, that stale, pungent smell that's coming out of it. And these are all leading to the issues that's there. The first thing that you need to do is you have to know your enemy. You need to take samples early from cows that are getting clinical case mastitis. A lot of them are coming back as strep ubers. They're coming up in various forms. You can get very toxic, very sick cows at all quarters. You can have very sublime infections, easy, but a lot of them are coming back as strep ubers. Um, I suppose, look, the first thing what I would do is, look at, uh, what I'd say to fellas is, look, uh, look at the, what am I, my milking pattern first. You're all checking cows now freshly calved. You've got to wear gloves and you have to pre-spray if you're handling a cow. That mitigates against you from spreading it. The condition of the teats will be nice and smooth, and the milk letdown is way better, especially in heifers. So that's the first thing that we'll do. Second thing, the clusters around the cows, that's grand. That's the next thing is, I, I, I know it's so busy now in the parlour, you're trying to watch cows with antibiotics, you're trying to watch fresh calvers, and when you put that in the pot together, you've got to have two groups. It's, it's unworkable otherwise. You have to have the fresh calvers and the antibiotics and the health, high cell count ones in a separate group that are done last. Because the practicalities of trying to do all this with, during, milk, during milking, or I see that, it's just, it's too hard, it's too difficult. So at least if you could contain the problem ones to the last row, less risk of spread. If that's not possible, you've got to disinfect clusters between cows. You have to, you have to, you have to minimize the spread because this thing can go to control quite quick within the springtime. We see this always around this time of the year. The fellas are saying, geez, I, every day I'm getting a new case, I'm getting a new case, cow is very sick. So cluster dipping, 30 ml of paracetic acid into, 20 cc, into 10 litres of water. And after 10 clusters go into that, you spill it and start fresh. The liquid cream dips, where you physically put them on with a cup, are a use at this time of year for this week, 10 days, where you're basically putting a barrier dip on it. I have a number of clients that have, I've put on it over the last week, 10 days. And anecdotally, the feedback is very positive. They're saying... Yes, I am seeing the case of the clinical mastitis. And won't go through the sprayer. You have to physically put on with a cup. Cows could be very crass when you're putting on, and mightn't suit. It mightn't suit, fellas. First thing, I suppose, put on enough teat spray. 15 mils per cow for milking. But if you find that I'm not getting the bounce out of that, the liquid cream dips are a good fallback. The well, other thing I would say to fellas is... Yeah, sorry, short. Go on, on, yeah. on, the, um, on the teat spraying as well, like... like I, re I remember we did some training many years ago, actually, in, in, the, in a day with Willie Buckley as part of AHI stuff that he was doing. And just that teat coverage is very important. I see a lot of people 
like you and I walk into parlors, they're looking at time to time for, from problems and they might be using 15 mil, but where is the 15 mil going though? That's the, in some cases, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, back teeds generally tend to get spread well, front teeds don't tend to get spread well. So I think uh, the emphasis needs to be put on the actual teeth spraying rather than just trying to give them a quick shot as they're going like out of the parlor. So, and I can't, I can't emphasize what you're saying enough either. Like, I think if people really improve their technique of, of teeth spraying and make sure that they do a good job on teeth spraying, they can actually do an awful lot for themselves. Um, and as you said, like, mm-hmm. like it's a different story if you're doing a half-assed job during the summer because you're going to get away with it because you have no load to deal with as such. They're going out to clean mm-hmm. pasture probably and mm-hmm. it's un- just unfortunate if they lie into a dung or something that they're going to be exposed. But like when they're, as you said, no matter how much liming a cubicle is and stuff, there is an infection pressure there. And you combine that with the reduced immunity then as well for that probably week or 10 days, maybe even a fortnight after calving as a result of the whole pressure on the system. Like it, it just makes, it's a great opportunity to try and stem the flow. And it's only going to cost you another few seconds basically per row to just, as, as I said to, to guys, drop the elbow and get the sprayer in under the front of the teeth and the front quarters as well. Mm-hmm. Because if you're spraying it with the hand up, and it's going up on her flank rather than on, onto the teeth. Or you might be just getting the tip, but all the front of the quarter is exposed in, and, and there is the risk that the bacteria is going to run down to the, to the end of the teeth, and that's how it's getting in then as well. So I think, I, like, personally, I hate the dipping because it's just slow, but like the teeth mm. spray done right, mm. I think, is vitally important. And um, just from the point of view of then with the with the dips that you're saying, is it from a teeth condition point of view as well that you're advocating that with the, or is it purely just from the barrier that it's offering? You see, you make a great point there, Stuart. The first thing what I would say to fellas is, forget about time when you're milking cows this time of the year. You have got to give, forget about throughput. You park that, you forget about it, and you give it the time, and you milk your cow in batches. Four or six, I cup across the four or six, I spray those four or six. If I'm going to clean the line of 10 or 20 units and then go spraying them as they're walking out the gate, I will not do the job just as good. And before you go cluster, before you go dipping, you do your spray clockwise, anti-clockwise, you wrap a bit of paper around the teeth, am I doing it good enough? If I am, and I'm still getting mastitis, well, then you look at the barrier dips. If not, you have to up your game, and then you may not have to go on the barrier dips. The great thing with the barrier dip is, to spite yourself, you'll do it right. <laughs> because you'll actually put it on the teeth, you dip the cup in it, and you can't, you can't make a ball of it. You, know, you can't do a bad job on it. So, but the reason we're doing it is it's really good on condition, and you're actually putting a physical barrier at the end of the teeth. Because when cows have oedema in the teeth, and the teeth are distended, and you look at the opening of the teeth, they just are open just purely from that congestion that's in the teeth. It's just the nature. You know it yourselves. You see it yourselves, the cows. You've got an odim in the other, the cow can hardly walk with the, the, until the springing breaks down and she is exposed. And it does help. But you're 100% right, Stuart. Go, go the other route, but do them right first. And then, you know. But the first thing I say to fellas, forget about time. You have got to just park that one and just give it, give it the time, you know. Yeah, and, and you're setting yourself up for the season, as I said, at the start by investing the time. And, now, like, and I mean, you said there at the start that everybody should be stripping. I wouldn't be so confident that everybody is, though. Yeah, you're, 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 you're probably dead right. Yeah, you are. You probably are dead right. And again, like this, you see, if you're in the time thing, like, oh, jeez, I have to get through these rows of cows. I have so much to do. But, like, you, get, you start dealing with clinical cases and I say, keeping cows out and dumping milk, then you'll see time. Go on. You know, it, it really is. Like, I'd be talking, forget about your eight minutes a row, like, I'd be talking 10, 12 minutes a row. That's the kind of time you're nearly talking now. Because you're, you're motoring around through it, I'm making sure I'm getting them prepped right. I'm cupping them on. I'm having a look at the cows going through. I'm spraying them going out the gap. Grand job. Out you go. You know, and it is really because I find in, you see, if you take your time, you're less likely to get caught with a cow going on antibiotics into the tank as well. Especially if they're in the group. Even with all the marks on it. You know, if you're rushing, sure as God, oh God, is she going into the tank? You know? Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing, Stuart, I, I, the, you know, the other thing that I think is just on the... The liners, a couple of you, a lot of you probably haven't done it, but liners. But if you get the chance, put in a new set of liners as soon as you can. Yeah. You know, if you haven't done already, technician might be in a, a position to go because they're probably still fitting away parlors and finishing up jobs. But um, 
I, I think that's one that should be prioritised. Yeah, um, sure. Like, again, like, thing coming, I, back I was just the and, yeah. coming back to the other team and the other, like, the new liners will just be better to bind to the teeth as a result of just less flexibility in them, I suppose, want to, like, whereas you get a lot of squeaks and squawks starting to come with all liners when cows are freshly calved because of that, or the email, like, and the, you will, yeah. not the way the other can be a bit off, offside, offside, like, with that, so. Yeah, yeah, bang on, bang on. Um, one thing I, I would say just on the cubicles a bit and, and just moving on to the cubicles a little bit, if any of you listening are, are running into a bit of batter with mastitis now at the moment, one thing that seems to be working well, and we know evidence to say this, but like a week of the disinfectant lime where you pack the other limes and go with the disinfectant limes, it's definitely like a huge difference on the cubicles. Anecdotally from the farmers are saying, you know, the couple of farmers I've been dealing with and we've put them on disinfectant lime for five to seven days every day, packed the hydrated or the other lime, and we went to barrier dip. They've all come back and said, yeah, the thing has settled down, the thing has bedded down. Because again, environmental type mastitis, it's on the cubicles, it's on the bedding. We're not going to sterilize anything. We're just keeping the infection level down. Just keeping the infection level down as much as you can. Um, they, they look, just look again at the scrapers, the timing. If you're on four times a day, five times, six times a day. To be honest, the higher the stacking in your shed, the more often you have to run the scrapers. If I have 140 cubicles or 120 cows, I'll get away with four or five times a day. If I have 160 cows, 120 cubicles, they need to be ran seven, eight times a day. You'll see it. You see it in the sheds that have the extra cubicles. The same level of infection in there. And most of you are in the second category where there's more cows than cubicles and a significant amount of them. So, you know, and cows are probably on five, six, seven kilos of ration because they're in full time with a far lot of you. So they're quite loose. You know, the cubicles are quite dirty like, you know. So yeah, that's so all, all the challenges cubicles. causing to this mastitis. And when you've less cubicles, you've more traffic, foot traffic up and down onto the cubicles because you've cows coming off and cows going on. And, and there's just, I suppose, just pressure, yeah. stock and red pressure in the shed then, which can also be uh, and cause an immunity issue. I, I've seen that in one case where a shed was just too overstocked in a, an expansion phase prior to the building yeah. being done. And just the levels of moisture in the shed were just phenomenal, really. Like So um, th no matter what they were doing, the cubicles were damp. Uh, and as a result, there was a fairly significant enough outbreak of mastitis as a result. Like, so I suppose it's something again, like I, I come back to some stuff that Marion has been saying there, Dan, as well, all the time about the different aspects of farming can do review. Like, so people need to look at, at the end of the calving season, what worked and what didn't work and what can they do better for next year. And look, I think with board BS requirements, etc., people do unfortunately need to be looking at building to have sufficient cubicles for the cows that they have it and maybe even a, a spare couple of cubicles to float around as well. Like, And it's good for men and beasts, I suppose, would be my thinking on it as well, even though I know it's easy for me to say because people have to spend money to invest in it. But And everybody has to go through that phase probably where you're trying to maybe get the cow numbers up before you do the building, but people should ultimately be trying to do the work to make cow comfort to, and a priority as well because I'm sure you'll agree that it contributes quite a lot to the whole mastitis piece and the cell count management piece. It is like, because you're at a stage there for Stuart, at this stage, I can't afford to do it and I can't afford not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's an awful position, you know, but it has to be put in the priority because if we look at the way the climate is going and look at how difficult it is now to get cows in and out this weather, you know, and our dependence on this, the variability of, oh, next February could be fantastic. You just have to build a system in and especially... When you look at the way the antibiotic thing is going to be going down the street, and even just from your own point of view, just not losing, not getting actual mastitis, it's, it's, a, it's an area that's going to have to be tackled and it's going to have to be put up high on the investment priority list within, within the farm because it's having too much of a repercussion on the, on the cows. They're falling out of the system too fast. It's having a huge cost on the system. Like, and you get into this spiral where you can't generate enough cash in to, to get the thing right because you're stuck in this, this, this spiral and trying to break out of it. You know, so well, look, it, 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 it's important. I, I think, look, the, the biggest thing for lads here now is just, first of all, get your samples off your coals, but take them right. You swab down the teeth, you clean the base at the end of the teeth. I'd hold the bottle away from the rump rail because cows could be a little bit dirty and just squirt your milk. And the sample bottle, it can't be the milk sample bottle that you get from the co-op. It must be a sterile bottle because there can be little detergents within the milk sampling bottle that will affect the cultures. And all you need is about a third of a bottle, cork it, have a jug of ice water if there's in the fridge in the farm if you're not close to it, and just put the code number and the date and then you can freeze it. 
if you're if you're not in a position to drop it in straight away. And um, the other thing I, I would say is just just have a couple of bits and pieces in your armory. I, I think for all cases of mass size this year, you need to be using a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like the Metacams or Finidines. Metacam is handy because it's subcut, it's under the skin in the last three days. And there's generics of that. You should be using all that. Like the, I see a lot of vets, they're saying they're recommended for all cases of mastitis to control the pain and control the inflammation. And then you need your injectable antibiotics then with your tubes then depending on your, your, your sensitivity coming back. But follow the full course of treatment. And, um, but if you get them, especially with strep uberus, we find them, if you get them early, that 12 hours, irrespective of how severe, has a massive impact on your clinical cure rate. And then, sure, I suppose, the, the next thing we need is, is milk recording then. Fellas, what are we, you know, the, what, uh, 18th of February? Yeah. Realistically, 10th, 11th, 12th of March, fellas should be, go, at least 60 days ago, 60 days from the first cold calved. Put that in your head and, uh, from, and look, some of you, there's probably a little bit of a lull coming in some fellas calving, some fellas on the height of it. You know, but milk recording, Stuart, is one that they're going to have to have to really prioritise. You know? Yeah, Dan, and then um, um, the, CM, the role of the CMT test maybe at this time of year as well. Yeah, the, the CMT, I, I think, would be used as a guide. You can... You have to use it as a guide. Sometimes, no, it can drive you crazy if you, you know, you'd say, I oh, should be dumping the whole lot of the cows, you know. In the sense of where I'd use it, really, I find it very good is, is just heifers, first calvers, just keep checking them. They're high in three or four. It doesn't worry your head because that's stress induced. You want to have a cow high in three and four quarters. So she'll sort herself out. But if she was high in one quarter, I just keep an eye on them because at first calvers, if you intervene early, you can get a very good cure. Because some of the calvers, if they're untreated, you'd notice it is a strep infection and they lighten back as the season goes on. So you get lightened quarters. They just get weakened and lightened. Some of them will calve down as two-year-olds, perfect. You know, but, but like early intervention with likes of those and you can get a very good cure. And she's mortaring away then for the year, you know. Um, for fresh, where I find it short more than anything is you identify the problem cows from last year that I dried off. So the bee stings has gone through. There's three or four days. Then I'll paddle test them. How did the dry cow do in them? So I'm not waiting 60 days for them. So if she paddle tests, very good. Some of you might know oh, it's the back right or the back lift or you might have taken records. Most of us wouldn't have a clue what it is, but we know she's high. But at least you could paddle test her and see did the dry cow work. If it didn't and she's very high, you, you dip the cluster after her you, you see what she's like in the next milk recording and to be honest, depending on how bad she is or how many heifers you have, yeah, you might be making a call, get rid of her. You know? Give her a shot of lead. But, um, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, and, and, and they're the calls that need to be making uh, made early rather than late, you know? And then, or at the very the minimum, then, I suppose, really, lads, at the very minimum, identifying her yeah. early on, like, is if, going to be important to stop in the spread which is what I was kind of saying at the start in terms of controlling cell count throughout the herd for the remainder of the season is really like it's now you're going to get on top of it otherwise you're kind of mm, mm. And looking over your shoulder for a lot of the year and, it's, and like as the year progresses cell count will kind of naturally rise a small bit anyway so if you have a if you're starting off of a higher base it's going to be an in, ever increasing problem then as the year goes on and obviously Spread, which is the big problem uh, in most herds, obviously, is going to mean that you're going to have a lot of problems potentially if you don't get on top of it early on. Like, like what you could do, Stuart, is, and I've like, oh, had a number of clients with this, you cluster dip everything until I do the first milk recording, right? First milk recording is done, then I dip the high ones and anything that calves from then until the next milk recording. So, right, I've, let's say I'm going to do milk recording on the 10th of March. I'll dip everything now from now till the 10th of March. Milk recording comes back, there's 10 out of the 100 high, I'll do 10, I'll dip those 10 and anything that calves from then until the next milk recording. Look, I might be dipping 20 clusters instead of 120 clusters. That might be somewhere managed, but no, I keep it locked into that group. A lot of them will sort themselves out. I do my second recording. At the end of the year, at the, after the second, I might be only dipping 10 clusters, but the, the 10 cows, high cows are no problem. They're diluted by the 110 good ones and they're doing no wreck to the rest of them. So that that's something that might be practical for lads to do. It might be worth it. You know, yeah. because Dan, Dan, any um, practical tip in terms of, we'll say, most a lot of herds now have cluster removers, we'll say, and, and if they don't have the cluster flush system, the dipping at a cluster is a challenge. So have you come across anything um, good?
good or useful that people maybe could do instead? Um, so we'll spray up into it. With, they'll have a little handheld sprayer with the paracetic acid solution. It is a help. Like Dave Gleason's work has found that it's the volume of water with the paracetic has given the best results. So when the litre of fluid has gone through it, he looked there with half a litre versus litre. So even though I'm spraying up and it is a help, it's, it's not as good as the flushing action through the physical flushing action of water. So right, what, what have I seen working well? I've seen a few fellas buy trolleys up on wheels that's basically up at waist height. And as you bring the cluster across, so that it's just dipping into that and you might kick the long, kink the long milk holes because sometimes when you bring them across, they'll automatically it's engage not, yeah. and you're just kicking the long milk hole, but you're not stooping, you're not di dipping in, and you're pushing that trolley down long. If it's on a 20 unit, you might have two of them, one to do the first 10, one to do the second 10. Look, it depends on pits. The buckets are the obvious ones. They're, they're a bit of a pain in the ass because you know they can get soiled quite easily and they're on the way and stuff. But, but look... The trolley up high or a bucket inverted upside down with another bucket up on top of that to keep it up high. It's, it's to mitigate against the stooping is the biggest thing. Yeah. Stuart is, but um, look, at there's a lot of people doing it and a lot of it is in our heads. You know, it, it's, it's once you get into the habit of it, there's a lot of fellas doing it and they just won't stop it. You know, they're very happy with it. But probably going forward, the investment in a cluster flush is something that might have to be looked at down the road as well, along with everything else. But it's probably... <laughs> Something worth looking at. Anyone buying a new parlor, they should be put in. It's a no-brainer. No-brainer, yeah, Stuart. They should I, be put I in. I suppose we've, we've discussed it before yourself and myself, Dan. Like, and uh, I suppose in the past, we would have kind of seen it maybe as something that was solving problems for people. But like with the, the whole um, selective dry coat therapy thing coming, it's from the point of view of reducing the spread. Like I know one of the Mill Quality Award winners that we've dealt with there in the past, he actually doesn't do a whole pile with the cows to come back high in the cell count um, on the milk recording any time, really, because he has cluster flush, so there's no risk of spread, and he finds that they're generally tending to sort themselves out if they don't manifest into a case of actual mastitis. So there's probably, I suppose I would have kind of said that they were nearly overkill a couple of years ago, the cluster flush, um, but I suppose more so in, in reality now, like they're, they're going to be a major part of, of milking systems into the future. Like So they, what we would like to see, of course, is if they would be granted whether it will be successful in that or not. I, won't, I don't know, but they would be a very important part of the whole antibiotic resistance uh, um, window, I suppose, that, that that should be made available oh, as yeah. an option to farmers, I would think, anyway. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And, and like, from a, lad's point, from a farmer's point, if you're looking at it, if you're looking at your clinical case of mastitis lads, and I say, geez, I'm getting an awful lot of back rights, or they're in the back quarters, I'm getting no front quarters. Well, then, it's a milking parlor line or spread issue, right? If it's completely random, right, left, front, back, left, completely, it's nearly always a cubicles. She lies on the left, she lies on the right. You know, so even that alone will give you an, ish, an idea of, so if, if fellas listening today are saying, geez, I'm getting mastitis, and it's all over every quarter, there's absolutely no pattern. Well, you prioritize the cubicles, you've got a disinfectant line, you up the rate of scrapers, and that should hopefully level the thing zone. If the lads are saying, geez, I'm always getting, they're all the fronts are getting it, or it's all the backs, or there's all a lot of back rights, well, you go after cluster dipping. This is only so much fellas can do. So even if they did that alone and tried to prioritize that, if they find that you, in both scenarios, you go after your post dipping and you make sure that's right for both scenarios, whether it's PAL or outside or inside. But at least that you can focus. And then I, with my samples coming back, telling me as well, that's giving me a direction of where to go. So, and you know, it's, it's, it's all about just trying to reduce the spread. And the other thing is, like, I know we preach, we'll go out to grass to get into grass, but like, you just line yourself up to get out as fast as you can, because it's some way of helping to help reduce this. If the thing improves anything, this week and next week is probably going to be difficult, but if you can get out at all, it's going to be a help. Yeah, so. it's just, uh, again, it's just clean, a clean environment, mm -hmm. even though it might be uh, kind of dirty enough in one sense outside. It's it's that time phase, just giving teeth the opportunity to close, etc., before contact with cubicles again, isn't it? Yes, I just wanted to pop in my head there. I see it there with cows, especially if you're on five, six kilos ration, if you're in the whole time, Cows will go straight for water after their milk, after milking, you know, because they're, 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 and I've looked at a few trucks, they're absolutely filthy. If you get any chance at all, clean out the water trucks, 
it's like milking cows. You know, the, if birds, especially likely to be dungy in them, or you, you get this mold building up inside them, or if you flip over crushes, hose them out if you can get a, a power hose them, or some kind of to wash them out. Don't underestimate that. If you can clean out the tracks and they'll get enough water into them, they'll, it's, it's a big factor. I think it's all a little bit of everything that's causing the issue. There's, is there any one thing that's causing it? It's a little bit of everything. It's the discharges, it's the calving boxes, and you're so busy you now, like it's, it's trying to keep its finger on the damn stuff that's trying to keep it. But, you know, the, the, the fresh water is, is, I think we're underestimating that a bit as well, like, you know. There's a good question in here now, um, Dan, as well. What about the risk of residues going forward with cluster flushing? Have you any comment on that? Yeah. Okay, so cluster flushing is, is used. So the cluster flush, what they usually do it is they have the cluster flush with a parasitic dacitran pump taking up the parasitic acid at a certain solution. And when the cluster comes off, there's a blast of air to suck up any excess milk, and then there's two blasts of parasitic acid water going through it. The parasitic acid is food grade in the sense that when it breaks down, it's hydrogen peroxide, acetic acid. Uh, and when that breaks down, you've H2O, water, plus a free radical oxygen. So there's the absolute, the industry and we're all is, is very happy with the fact of no residues in it. We have some clients that can't cope with, you know, parasitic acid can be quite pungent. You know, it can be quite irritating for some people. And they just have to cluster flush with purely the water going through it just the water on its own, and it, they're getting a super job on it. It's working very well. Again, the logic makes sense. There's a litre of water going through every unit, flushing it out. So for people that have an issue with parasitic acid, it, no, put, put the water through it. You can't do that with a bucket because you're just going to spread all before you. You need the parasitic acid to kill the bugs that I put into the bucket for before the neck. That's why we notice the kill rate dropping after 10 units. That's why we say 8 to 10 units. Because after, with, between the organic matter and the milk solution in it, you're going to get the kill rate drops from about 90, 95% down to 50, 55%. And you end up spreading it. So that's why you can't dip a cluster into a bucket of water unless you have a fresh bucket for every single unit. And that's not practical. Do you know? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, no fear whatsoever of parasitic acid. No fear of it. Very good. Um, just then, what are your thoughts on the effectiveness of good pre-milking clean and spray on cows? And is it a bad job to be washing cows' teeth before milking? Great point. Absolutely no washing. Do not wash a cow. You pre-spray, you use the teeth spray to wash a cow, but you must wipe it off. I, I, to be honest, in my opinion, I think the amount of pre-spraying being used without it being wiped off is more of a risk than the parasitic acid. Yeah. Residue from a residue point of view, yeah. you know, and, and that I'd be more worried about that. Like the pre spraying should be used as a management tool, not as a consistent thing. But unless you're in a position, and this is coming back to the time during milking, if fellas are rushing out and harping on about throughput, they will not wipe it off. They'll just spray it, cups on, cups off, flush it, and dip the clusters and spray them out the gap, you know. So, you know. You'll, you'll not, the lads don't diss themselves. If you pre-spray the cow and you strip them and give them a quick wipe, they will be leaking out milk. They'll be pumping out milk. The teats are lovely and plump and you get a very good milk out of the cow. You know, they, they just, they're stimulated. The, oxy, the milk letdown reflex is stimulated. The oxytocin is clicking in. She's eating her ration and she's pumping out the milk and she's going to milk out very good then. You know, whereas you drive in your cows, there's no touching, cups go on, you get what they call this bi bimodal milking. You get a run of milk first and then stop. No milk coming. And then after 30, 40 seconds, the flow of milk gets going then afterwards. So it's... That's, the that's, that's why you don't get... That stage. Exactly, exactly, you know. And so you okay. think that it's taking you longer, but you actually gain time because they milk out faster. You know, but um, okay. this time and of year, it's question. a big help. Yeah, another question then. What about spraying your gloves before stripping each cow instead? Yeah, great idea. Perfect. No problem. Yeah, do the job for you. So, yeah, do the job so for could, you. You could do that instead of actually pre-spraying the cows. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem, yeah, no problem. I think where the, the pre-spraying of the cows themselves is that um, for cows that could be quite dirty on cubes, especially I see this in, on overstocked sheds, cows could be quite dirty coming into a parlour. Like, it's great to, if you spray them first, it softens any organic manure on them, and it's just, as you're stripping them, then it comes off lovely in your hand, like, you know, you'll come way off, yeah. and um, 
You know, you, you just have it's to be in it in it. Exactly. So you're dead right. Same principle. Same principle, yeah. Same principle. Yeah. Which, so yeah, you said about the thermogenics there, and I was well into TBCs. Um, so the like the pre-spraying does a big thing for you in terms of the thermogenics in particular. I know you're a big fan of it from that point of view. Yeah, it's your lads, the logic makes it like when a cow comes into the parlour, there's zero thermogenics inside in that other nothing, zero. It's the minute we start harvesting it, like thermogenics start coming into it. So the thermogenics come into the plant from the teats and from the fecal matter around it. So if they fall off or whatever, but. Primarily they're coming in and the teats and the fact or not washing and stuff then is, is, it can build up inside in the plant itself, you know. So definitely the, the pre-spring, you see you're removing them at source, so it's going to be going to be a huge help, you know. And especially the TBCs as well, you know, especially some of the, the crops might be on four-day collections, they're probably back to three and two-day now at this stage because the volumes are coming through. But like when you were on three and four-day collections, you know, you're going to need to keep the bacteria low down to, 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 to maintain it then on the four-day collection and stay under the thresholds like in TVCs. Yeah, okay. You know, so but, um, I suppose we'll wrap it up with that, Dan. So I'll just ask you to summarise it, I suppose, into maybe three key points for people to take away with them if you, you don't mind. Okay. I think, first thing, so know your enemy. So get your samples, right? Get your samples. Thing. Next thing then is look at what are my sources of infection. You look at the cubicles, disinfecting the clusters, the application of the teeth spray, and look at the calving boxes, okay? That's the that's, that's second, third thing. The, the, the fourth thing I would look at is if you're hitting trouble, if you're, if you're there and always saying, geez, I'm going through a tough time, look at is there any, are you having issues with milk fevers, retained afterbirths, a lot of discharges from cows, is there some underlining factor that this could be piggybacking on it, you know? So just, just try and keep a note of that. Is there a link between my milk fevers? Because if I have 100 cows and I have 6, 8, 9 milk fevers, there could be another 20 subclinical milk fevers there that I don't know about. So maybe it might be worth looking at and, chat and just we had that chat about maybe as you, you might talk about there, giving the calcium boluses to ones that are left to calf. Maybe that's something to look. But it's all about containing the level of infection inside in the herd and take time during milking. Take time during milking. Very good, Dan. I suppose just to come back to that calcium piece, um, I generally find that there's a lot of the same people are tuning in there every every week anyway. So they'll have heard Joe talking about the, the whole milk fever piece a couple of weeks ago. And that graph or that chart that he showed, uh, one of the very first slides that he showed on the day, the impact of calcium on all the other aspects of, of metritis and uh, it's like ketosis even and mastitis as well. So it's calcium... Um, is influencing muscle function. If a teeth doesn't close after milking, a uh, cow goes out to cubicles no matter how clean they are, if it's taken a long period of time, obviously um, there's a risk, a high greater risk of infection occurring in that scenario. So I suppose just to, that's Dan's point in relation to if you're finding that there's a lot of trouble, some uh, small niggly problems, but there's a lot of them, um, just to try and investigate maybe is it a subclinical milk fever issue maybe and uh, responding to that could have very uh, good outcomes for you in many cases in terms of, as I said, retained clear clearings are gone, which will improve reproductive performance in due course. And in context of what we're talking about today, your teeth muscle sphincters will be working much better. Teeth will close quicker after milking. And as a result, you should have a, a reduced infection pressure then because the natural barrier is there against the infection. So... Um, that's it for today. As I said, we're trying to keep them brief at the moment because people have plenty to do. It's great to see uh, nearly 100 people on the line. So thanks a million, Dan, for coming on. And uh, we'll see you all again next week. And in the meantime, take care.